So for an actor, what I've learned is, and what I teach, because I teach at universities, colleges all over the country, is that we have to step out of this place where we're waiting for life to happen. We're waiting for people to come to us, waiting for people to recognize us, to see us, to finally understand who we are and what we've got and why don't they appreciate us, right? We all have a little bit of that. What I've learned is, is that life demands us to step into that world, step into life and commit to what we really wanna do. It's like you show up on the grid, you become visible and it takes balls. It takes courage and strength to step up and realize that you are worthwhile, that you are valuable, that you have something to say, and that you might have some amazing epiphany, creative imagining, an idea that could solve an amazing problem and go out and touch the world. Anybody, all you women, anybody wear Spanx? I do. No. <laughs> no, anybody know what Spanx is? Well, did you read the story about that woman? She had never done business in her life. She didn't know how to do business. She'd never raised money. She'd never put anything together. She got an idea. She researched it. She went online. She found out how to do this. She had no money. She found a lawyer, and she did all the hard work. And then the lawyer, because she worked so hard, was willing to do some of the legal issues for her, you know, uh, pro grata. And she was able to put it all together. And then she even called a major company, okay, a major franchise around the country, and I can't remember the name of it. But she called them up, and nobody calls these companies and pitches. You have to go to some kind of a trade show. You got to buy a booth. You got to put a lot of money out, which stops most people. She called them up, talked them into giving her five minutes. She got in, drove forever, got to the place, went in there, and started to pitch the idea. And the woman wasn't getting it. She took her in the bathroom and said, would you come in the bathroom for a moment? And she took her in there, and she put them on, and she demonstrated it. And the woman got it and she put it in eight stores, and the rest is history. She's a billionaire now. All because she had the faith to believe in her idea and realize it doesn't take money to succeed. It takes innovation, creativity, and balls, and you go out there, and she didn't know enough to know what you're not supposed to do. And I hate to say it, we're in a world where you have to stop trying to do what it's supposed to be done Everything is about innovating, finding new creative solutions, going out there and taking whatever talents and abilities you have and find out how to plug it in and find out where your pot of gold is. And that's what I'm doing. Right now I'm developing this new thing. I'm going to do a, because there's no space shows out there that I love. I have worked on this show since I pitched Battlestar back in 1999 when nobody was doing trailers, by the way. In fact, when I put my trailer together, my second coming trailer, anybody seen my second coming trailer online? Anybody seen that? I could play that. Um, I, uh, I didn't know anything about filmmaking, nothing like this, but I saw, why are they bringing all these shows back, Chips, and not Battlestar Galactica, which had reached 65 million people? And I kept thinking, something's wrong in this equation. Someone's not getting something. So what I wanted to do is I went to Universal, and I went up, I called, I talked to the legal department, and I was trying to figure out you know, who do I talk to? Where do I have a meeting? They didn't even know they owned Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> and I finally, I finally got a meeting. I remember I went up there and I found a, a kind of tracing, you know, step by step. I started uh, writing like Battlestar stories and, and then I kind of went up to Universal and had a bunch of meetings in places where I, it's like the rabbit hole. One department doesn't know what the other department's doing, right? Just a bunch of, everybody makes people, their friends, vice presidents at Universal. So you've got hundreds of vice presidents that never make any decisions. It's true. And I'm pitching to these guys, and they can't do anything for me. But ultimately, they connected me to all these licensees because of the sci-fi channel playing Battlestar. And they put me to, with, with some of the writing places, I went to iBooks, wrote Battlestar books, uh, went to Rob Leefield. Uh, Extreme Press and wrote Battlestar Galactica comics, did all this stuff, and then ultimately I started going, why don't I go pitch putting together, you know, a new Battlestar movie or television series? Went upstairs and I pitched to this company, the guy that was in charge of making decisions, and he couldn't visualize or understand what a Battlestar Galactica series could look like for today. And I thought it was a no-brainer, and I went out and I put together a storyboard 
that ultimately had voiceover and music, and then ultimately go, how about doing a little cut scene, a little live action scene? And I found some friends that had a camera, you know, and somebody that had this and somebody that had that, and I went and did a live action cut scene. And I go, this is so much fun. And so I did another one. And then ultimately, of course, I have no money. And of course, my little credit card just goes ka-chinging, ka -chinging. But when you start doing something that you're really excited about, you forget about the money. You forget about, like, all of you with your credit cards, I'm sure. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm having the time of my life. And I remember I get to a point where I'm sitting in this big, huge building structure where they used to house the Spruce Goose. And I've got a 100-man crew. I've got fans from all over the country driving in with their costumes, their hardware, because I have no budget for that stuff. And by the way, if you ever do a no-budget anything, let me tell you, a no-budget anything is going to cost you a lot of money. <laughs> Why? Because if you do not feed all these people that are working for free, they will mutiny on you. And you better have their favorite junk food. I'm telling you. I spent a lot of money on this no-budget thing. And step by step, this little animated storyboard grew into the Second Coming trailer. And then we started playing it. I remember playing it at Comic-Con in San Diego the first time. And everybody had heard about this mythological trailer that nobody knew if it really existed because nobody made a trailer unless you had a movie. And I played it, and I remember the room was packed, like a room like this, 10 times back, multiple screens. I'm nervous as hell because if you like sci-fi and somebody screws with your story, changes it even a little bit, you know what I'm saying? And I was terrified that they were going to hate this thing. And I remember playing it. And at the end of it, there was the longest, most pregnant silence I've ever heard in my life. A little bit like what happened to Ron Moore when he pitched his new Battlestar series to all the Battlestar fans. You saw that little clip on the, uh, the thing there? Well, I swear, I was terrified. And all of a sudden, after this long silence, was this explosion of people clapping and cheering and all this stuff. I could not believe that we'd hit a home run. And we got carried around the world to multiple conventions playing it. And guess what? Harvey Weinstein of Miramax, the, one of the top distributors, calls me up thinking, he's got a trailer. We got all these reviews. You must have a movie. <laughs> and Universal doesn't even know I made this thing. And I'm like going, they're going to arrest me. I'm going to jail, you know? And I didn't make it to make money, but I made it to inspire a revival. Um, it was one of the most extraordinary things I ever did because what it taught me was, it taught me that anything is possible. Just like the woman with Spanx, I didn't have a clue about how to put anything together. All I knew was I had this feeling. I believed in it. I thought, this needs to come back. This is a story, by the way. I'm, I love great sci-fi. Sci Visionary, intelligent sci-fi. I love it. And so... There just was not enough of those kinds of programming out there. And networks always are in a hurry to get rid of those kinds of shows, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm just taking each step, figuring out what to do, asking questions, and finding out that people were willing to come help me because the minute you have the balls to stop talking about what you want to do and trying to get people interested in what you want to do, that you actually have the balls to actually go do it with whatever resources you have. If you got five cents, you do whatever you can with five cents. You just start doing it, and all of a sudden, I got all these people that were excited. People talked to other people and said, you know what Richard's doing? And then I got Dean Cundy, the DP for Jurassic Park, Apollo 13, brings his 35 millimeter camera with 2,000 feet of 35 millimeter film. I get Volker Ingo, who won the Academy Award for ID4 Special Effects Supervisor, comes on board looks at my epic film that I made over 18 months and says, Richard, this is never going to work. He goes, he goes, this is going to take you millions of dollars to do the post to make it look good. He says, what you got to do is cut it down to like two minutes. I go, two minutes? You know, I had all this footage. And so finally he took me over to Dreamscape, and they helped me to write a trailer script, right, which I had never done before, which I wrote. And then they helped me to shape it down to this two-minute thing and then they also helped and this is back when CGI was in its kind of infancy and I began putting together you know the designs and the ships and do the compositing and all that stuff which I know a lot about now 
you know, and we were doing a lot of green screen kind of early on when not too many people were doing it. And it was just an amazing experience of slowly putting this thing together and then finally playing it and having the kind of response which every filmmaker, everybody in their, their life should have one time experience when you feel like you hit a home run, you know. So I, I finally got this thing going. And, you know, the funny part was I also produced the 25th Battlestar Anniversary Convention. And I invited because at that time I'd heard Ron Moore was going to do this thing. Um, Tom DeSanto and Brian Singer, who did X-Men, the movies, basically they had really wanted to do a new Battlestar series. Uh, Sci-Fi Channel, Universal, just could not envision doing a Battlestar series. And they got a deal over at Fox, but Fox dropped the deal when Brian Singer had to jump onto X-Men 2 because there was a problem with the, the movie. And then they dropped the Battlestar deal, which was going to actually include me and Dirk Benedict and some of the original actors. And then they took it over to Sci-Fi Channel uh, and tried to do it there. Not interested. And they were only open to maybe doing a reimagined version, which Ron Moore brought in. And everybody was against that, thinking they're going to screw it up like they do with every classic they bring back. You ever notice how they take a classic and they give you the trappings of it, but they take the heart and soul out of the show that you love so much? And that's what I thought they were going to do. And when I honestly saw, met Ron Moore, and I think he looked at me as Darth Vader because <laughs> I'd written a few scathing letters, you know, about networks and studios and how they don't get us or appreciate sci-fi, you know, and how they screw everything up. And I wasn't being specific about Battlestar, but I was kind of, you know, making a point. And so I invited him because I thought, I'm going to invite everybody. I'm going to invite Ron Moore, Glenn Larson, Tom DeSanto, Brian Singer. Let everybody come and pitch their idea of Battlestar and then let you make your decision, right? And so guess what? He came and then he played his new trailer. And back at that time, nobody had ever seen um, action scenes with no music, no sound effects, just drums, right? And we're used to that now, but back when they played it, we all looked at it like this, and it was the coldest, freezing room I've ever felt in my whole life. I felt horrible for him. I really did. One of the things I noticed, because no matter how different it was, I said, somebody has a vision. Somebody is talented. Even though it's totally different than anything I you know, could, could imagine, it was something was amazing in it. And I remember standing up, and he kind of tells this story sometimes. And then Moses stood up in the room and calmed the people down because everybody was pissed. Everybody was really angry. And I really just wanted to say, you know, I said, no matter how different this piece is, I got to tell you, take my hat off because there's a vision, there's a creativity, there's heart, there's soul behind this. There's something here. And I think, you know, that kind of statement I made opened the door to having a conversation with Ron Moore. And he realized I wasn't the, you know, the, the saboteur that I was appearing to be. Although he did cast me as a terrorist, didn't he? <laughs> wow! Epiphany! Now it all comes clear. Oh, and he must have had so much joy blowing me out the airlock at the end. Finally got rid of that hatch guy. Boom! No, I, I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I, I, he invites me over. And I swear, the minute I walk in the room and start talking to him, and he says, look, I don't know how you feel, but, you know, if the show gets picked up, would you be interested in doing something? And I was so conflicted because I'd put so much time, energy, money into bringing back the original Battlestar. But when I sat down and talked to him, and he talked about this political revolutionary a la Nelson Mandela, only slightly darker. <laughs> that was a little bit of a joke. Um, you know, would you be interested? And I remember for the first time in my life, that I had said no so many times because things weren't exactly right. Because I'm a very idealistic person. I was looking for something with meaning, with heart, with soul. You know, something that I felt that I could do my best work in. And so I always said no. And I closed down my career because I to told that turned down so many television series. And then everybody stops coming. And they don't look at you as, you know, you're doing it because of a deeper, emotional, caring, meaningful reason. They look at it as you have ego and think you're too good for our project. That's why you're turning it down. So they get pissed off at you. And I really kind of closed down my career. And for the first time, I finally said yes, even though I was really conflicted. And I remember going in and having the meeting. And the first thing I noticed is that the writers on the staff, I had gone to acting school with. 
In fact, one of them had really had a whole profound relationship with the mother of my child, you know. And I'm like, wow, this is a little strange. Uh, of course, I learned a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know before, but I also, I also had a chance to really connect and realize that I was really amongst people that was like family to me. Uh, we had gone to the Eric Morris Actress Workshop. One of the best experiences I ever had is part of what I do when I teach. Acting is a process for everybody, believe it or not, when it's taught the right way. Um, anyway, I got cast on the show. It was a one-shot deal, and the one-shot deal turned into five years on the show. It was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. Um, Mary McDonnell, Edward Almos, you know, uh, Katie Sackhoff. I, I think Katie, you know, amongst probably all the rest of them, but I'm not going to be surprised if she wins an Academy Award, you know, in the next few years. I, I don't know if you saw the new Riddick movie. I love Riddick, but I really didn't like the new Riddick movie. Anybody like the new Riddick movie? Yeah, see one hand clapping. <laughs> it looked like they just threw it away. You know what I mean? It was a stupid, cheesy story, and they were trying to save money. But the best thing in that story was Katie Sackhoff. I thought she did a terrific job. <clears throat> I'll call.